Hi. We are going to uh, reuse these notes to get the definitions down for the various rhetorical devices that we're going to be looking through uh, and looking for throughout the year. We're going to discuss why do authors use them and what purpose do they serve, basically. And then uh, eventually we want to get to the point of using them ourselves in our own speaking and writing. So let's take out those notes that I gave you and let's fill in, um, fill, it, fill things in. All right, so first we need to talk about what is rhetoric, okay? Well, rhetoric is the art of speaking or writing effectively. It is the art or science of using language to change or influence behavior. That's why in college you can take a class called rhetoric, which is similar to a communications class. But in this communications class, you might use it to speak, learn to speak effectively or write effectively. But most of the time it's going to involve those persuasive elements. So if you remember last year in English 10, you did a partner speech and you did a selling of a product and you were trying to persuade us. All of that is rhetoric, okay? So what we're going to do right now is we're going to go through and mark down in your notes the different types of rhetorical devices that there are. Um, so there are up to nine. You'll notice that I added one. You have anaphora, allusion, antithesis, parallelism, and then ethos, pathos, and logos. And then all authors, whether you're doing fiction or nonfiction, uses figurative language. You'll notice that I also added buzzwords at the end. Okay, so let's take a look at um, some of these specifically. So for example, well, before we go on to that, sorry, I jumped the gun there, is why use rhetorical devices in the first place? What's their purpose? If we slide this over, we're going to find out that the purpose is that writers use rhetorical devices to get a required response. It's really important that we understand that rhetorical devices are so that everybody in the audience has the same reaction. And that re reaction can be an emotional one, it can be uh, a logical one, and it, so, but most often it is for the purpose of emotion, okay? Oh, the line stays there. So let's erase that. All right, so now let's get into a few of them that we're going to be talking about. First, we have illusion, okay? An illusion, as you know, is a reference to something, something that the reader is already supposed to know, you know, like literature or great, great sayings of great men or mythology, works of art, and even history, okay? Um, when you're using illusions as a writer, you have to consider who your audience is. If uh, the author is writing for my generations, they might make some references to the 80s. I'm reading a great book called Ready Player One, which is all about the 80s, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. For most of you, however, those illusions would go right over your head. But for everybody, this one doesn't because we had grown up knowing uh, why did the chicken cross the road. The three main places that, uh, you know, the more knowledgeable you are in the areas of history, mythology, and religion, um, the more you can see the illusions in literature and in communication and rhetoric in general. So the better you, better read you are in those three areas, the more you can pick up on that. And you also remember that last year we talked about how Shakespeare, there's tons of allusions to Shakespeare. Well, the next term that we have is antithesis. And you'll notice that I've already got some things highlighted there. But antithesis literally means the opposite. And its purpose is to establish a relationship between two contradicting ideas. It's intentional and a lot of times it's parallel in structure. So for example, in this quote, integrity without knowledge is weak and useless. And knowledge without integrity is dangerous and dreadful. Integrity and knowledge are used as opposites, weak and useless. And then also there's parallel. Probably one of the most famous allusions and one that you could use as an example is at the beginning of the story, the um, tale of two cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Okay, so now let's talk about parallelism. 
look at that definition and please do not write it down. <laughs> Parallelism is to maintain syntactic and thematic similarities in sentences. Any grammatical element in sentences can be parallel. Parallelism adds clarity to the sentence. Okay, essentially, okay, um, whoops, essentially parallelism is a repetition of a grammar structure. Look for a list, commas, semicolons, and the use of repetitive words. Parallelism is a lot about parts of speech, nouns, lists of nouns, lists of adjectives, lists of clauses. So that's what you need to look for. At this time, you're going to have to flip your paper over because uh, we're going to keep going with some of those terms. The next term we're going to talk about is anaphora. Anaphora is the repetition of words, phrases, or clauses, usually at the beginning of a sentence. It is an intentional repetition. If you take a look at um, the poem just for today, what I'd like you to do is to highlight the anaphora. Just for today, I will live through the next 12 hours and not try to tackle all of life's problems at once. Just for today, I will improve my mind. I will learn something useful and I will read something that requires thought and concentration. Just for today, I will be agreeable. I will look my best, speak in a well-modulated voice, be courteous and considerate. Just for today, I will not find fault with friend, relative, or colleague. I will not try to change or improve anyone but myself. Just for today, I will do a good turn and keep it a secret. If anyone finds out, it won't count. Just for today, I will have a program. I may not follow it exactly, but I will have it. I will save myself from two enemies, hurry and indecision. Just for today, I will do two things I don't want to do just because I need the discipline. And just for today, I will believe in myself and I will give the best to the world and feel confident that the world will give its best to me. If you highlighted just for today, I will, you have found the anaphora. But you will also notice that it's parallel. It's a phrase, the phrase just for today, followed by the subject and the verb, and it looks like a list of sentences. The last thing on your notes, sorry, we've got to click here is, um, oh, first I want to talk about buzzwords, and you're going to have to sneak this in here. Buzzwords are the words that we use to elicit an emotional response. It might be profanity, the use of racial slurs, or it might be an ultra-sensitive topic at the time. So right now, 2017 terrorism is um, a buzzword. Racism and being accused of racist ideas is really, an, uh, elicits an emotional response. Okay. And the last thing we're going to have you fill in, but without the examples, is Aristotle's rhetoric. Okay, And you guys remember what they are. Logos, pathos, and ethos. And I just want you to write those on A, B, and C. Logos, pathos, and ethos. Because we're going to be watching some videos about uh, choosing whether logos is for logic, argument, and reasoning. And Aristotle thought that logos was more refined than ethos and pathos. So he put more stock into logic than the others. Pathos, remember, is emotional, okay? The emotional appeal. You're going to try to evoke the sympathies or the humor of the audience, okay? Ethos, which we dealt with last year, is your reputation, okay? The moral character, the credibility of the writer. Because no matter how persuasive you think you can be, if we don't trust you, it doesn't matter what you say. Okay? That is the last of the video. Um, we will be uh, using this information and coming back to it to do various activities. Have a great day.